Hi there, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. My name's Trevor, and I've been teaching at New School of Architecture and Design for the past six years now, and I'm honored to be a part of this special virtual event where we are highlighting six wonderful panelists tonight. We'll be talking to six of our faculty who are, um, they are professionals while they are teaching. So we're gonna hear about the importance of how we're incorporating what we are learning through our professional practice and how we're incorporating some of that knowledge into and why it's important to incorporate that into our uh, teaching. So tonight I wanna to begin by um, telling us, telling uh, everyone who is here, thank you for joining us. Um, our, this is our 40th year anniversary of our school. And um, this is tonight's theme is about our human centered design. This was coincided by, uh, this was coined by our uh, beloved Marvin, our, foreman, our former president of New School. And he thought that this was our North Star, our guiding principle to be human centered. So tonight, um, our faculty, we really strive to train citizen architects and designers. And let me remind everyone that we have three pillars at our school, professional practice, environmental empathy, and human welfare and community engagement. So we have six wonderful panelists. Tonight we'll be talking to uh, Dan Manlagat from architecture, Anjum Razvi from interior architecture and design, Beth Ahmed from graphic design and interactive media, Christine Wonder from construction management, and Victor Nacy from uh, product design, and Julio Medina from architecture. So thank, thank you all for joining us tonight, all the panelists. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to introduce each of the panelists and I'm going to ask them to share about uh, their personal path, what brought them to teaching at New School. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, you know, I, I wasn't expecting to teach when I came to New School. Um, I had been working as a, uh, I've been working out in East County. I was writing patents for an anti-identity theft company. And um, that was going really well. And um, I was given an opportunity, I, I was asked to see if I would like to teach at New School because um, Prisca, who you know, I went, to, I went to graduate school with Prisca Bermudez at, at uh, San Diego State University. At SDSU, and um, we both got our master's degree together, and she's the one who directed me to new school, and uh, she thought that I would do a wonderful job teaching world regional geography, and I wasn't expecting to teach at that time, but I thought that um, I'm the type of person who thinks whenever there's a good opportunity that comes along, you want to try to take it. If there's a door, that comes along, you have the opportunity to open it, then you, you got to step through that door sometimes. And since I was interested in teaching, but I thought that teaching would come much later in my career. I wasn't expecting to teach at that time six years ago, but since New School had, had approached me, they liked everything that I'd done as a professional, I thought that, you know, let's try it out. And so I began teaching a world regional geography and I ended up loving it. And from that point on, I knew that I wanted to incorporate teaching while I was also conducting my personal business. And for me, I think that it's important to, uh, for me, it fulfills me. While I'm working in my professional job and teaching, I'm able to be productive at work, putting things out that hopefully makes society a more positive place to be. And I can pass on my knowledge to those who are going to lead future society, which is all of, or probably many of you who are attending tonight. 
So with that, um, I would like to introduce our first panelist will be Dan uh, Manlegat. He has extensive experience with work in a, uh, in a diversity of architecture firms in many cities, including Seattle, Columbus, Ohio, and San Diego. As a Cal Poly alumni, he has worked in all aspects of the building industry process with a wide range of project types, high rise, educational, religious, commercial, mixed use, sports complexes, theaters, and besides serving on various industry committees and receiving design awards, Dan has found that continued teaching and learning in all its aspects are keys to maintain the passion for architecture and the balance of enjoying life. So with that, Dan, what, what's your path? How did you begin teaching? How did you end up in new school? Um, thanks, Trevor. It, it, I love discussing this. And as you as you talked about my path from San Diego to San Luis, all the way back here to San Diego again, who knows if this is the, the end of my path, um, working in, in large and smaller firms um, and all those uh, project types that you mentioned. After a while, uh, I had a question myself, um, uh, who am I designing for? Is it the client or is it the end user? Um, what is it? What am I trying to do in life? And what kind of mark do I want to leave behind? So we have these grand ideas when we, and when we enter architecture school and when we start working and, and they vary, are we, are we, do we want to put that grand building? Do we want to win an award? Do we want the money? Is it for the community or is it some universal goal? So the thing I found out very quickly is that life changes, culture, people, governments, and you will change. So what you believe in when you're 17 will change. And if not, it will be enhanced. And so opportunities come and I want to take on these opportunities to build on my menu to learn about these changes. And teaching was one of those opportunities to learn about the changes that were going on in architecture. So in practice, I have been practicing for a while. And I would use this statement after speaking to a client or a consultant. And after they said something, I would try to help neutralize this meeting, right? I was so tired of everyone yelling at each other. So um, after hearing someone mention a comment, I would, I would look at the, uh, the consultant or the client and say, you know, you are a handsome and intelligent person. And that made them feel more confident, um, more honest and in the response for future uh, conversations that we had. And then I, I met uh, Gil Cook, who was the Dean of Architecture at the time at New School. And he wanted to chat and I was looking into teaching. Um, I just I thought we were meeting just to catch up and I was so busy in practice. And so Gil and I were just talking about San Luis Obispo and, you know, uh, farmer's market. And then Gil asked me, um, Dan, what do you think architecture school is? And so I just started describing school and not even about studio or the classes. I just started talking about the culture of the school and the people I went through with. And as he was listening, he was looking at me and he said, you know, Dan, you're a handsome and intelligent person. And then I left this office thinking, yeah, I am. And I didn't even realize I accepted the teaching position. Okay. And I walked to my car and, uh, and I said, wait a minute, that's my line. He used my line. So <laughs> the master got me using my own tactic. But little did I know that uh, uh, he wasn't hiring me to share all my technical things that I know about architecture. He, he, was, he was bringing me on to share these stories. And I, I have a lot of stories about my mistakes. And, and if all my students here, they, they know about these mistakes. And there are plenty of them. There's a lot of stories about these mistakes. And if any architect tells you that they don't have red lines in their drawings or RFIs and they have zero change orders, they're full of shit. We make mistakes all the time in this business, all the time, as we do in life. So what's in our toolbox to fix that mistake is really the thing. So why I teach is to share these stories. It's a method of teaching. I share them with faculty, parents, students, and try to connect and understand with each other to try to make a better classroom. And that's my path as a brief. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, I want to remind everyone that um, as you're listening to the panelists, if you have any questions, if there's anything that they say that sparks your interest, if you have a question about something that they've done or something that they mentioned, feel free to post those questions. And then uh, those will go to Lucy and she'll convey those, mess she'll convey those questions to me. And uh, so we'll be able to answer all the questions you have for us, okay? So next up, um, 
we have Anju Razvi, and Anju is a certified interior designer who owns and operates a full service commercial hospitality and residential interior design firm. Throughout her 40 years in the industry, she has been recognized with multiple national and international design awards and published projects in the San Diego Tribune, San Diego Home and Garden, and Decor and Style. So with that, Anjum, what led you, what was your path in leading you to new school and teaching? Okay, so I'm going to trace my path a little further back than Dan's and just wanted to say my design journey started in Mumbai, India, where I went to school for architecture. Um, and I, about a year after that, I got married and came to the United States and uh, very quickly realized I was not really an architect in this country. Um, <laughs> I had to go through a lot more before I could call myself an architect. I was working for an architectural firm, trying to follow my path to become an, 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 a licensed architect. And then very quickly, my path got interrupted with starting my family and having my two children where I, as like most mothers, was debating how do I go back to work or do I kind of stay home? So anyway, I stayed home uh, taking care of my kids and my path crossed with a gentleman who did spec home building in San Diego. He introduced me to the idea of starting my own business and working for him. I did that for a while, got kind of bored with it. I was more of a glorified drafts person. And so when I was ready to go back into the field, I decided I did like being my own boss but I would go more into the interior design, interior and architecture end of it and started my own business, started with very bad residential jobs <laughs> initially, uh, which graduated to some nicer higher end residential jobs. And one of my residential clients then owned a hotel in San Diego, which was the Pickwick Hotel, which got transformed to the Sophia Hotel. And I was the designer for him, not having done anything like that before, it was amazing and huge, so that introduced me to that. During this time, one of the, uh, I was working, I, 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 my path crossed again with Jan Bast, who was the design program director at Design Institute of San Diego. And like you, Trevor, she asked me if I would like to teach and I had never considered teaching. That was not on my horizon. That was nothing that I was my ambition or wanting to do, but she said I had the skills to do it. And I was kind of surprised to hear that I didn't really know. And uh, so I started working there as an adjunct professor for almost 16 or 17 years. Denise Hami, who some of you may know, uh, was also the program director there. She then moved over to new school. And a year ago, she contacted me to see if I would be interested in teaching at new school. I have to say, I was instantly attracted to the school. The diversity in the school was amazing, both in the population of the students and the, and the professors. And it was a natural draw for me. And I've been teaching since then. It's only been like four quarters. So I'm fairly new at new school. That's it. Thanks, Anju. So next up is uh, Beth Aman. And she's part of the graphic design and interactive media department. And so Beth, what led you to teaching at new school? What was your path? Uh, well, I can trace it back to starting an architecture school as well. Um, I went to UC Berkeley's architecture program. Um, I happened to go there um, in 2007, right before the housing market crashed. So I uh, got to graduate alongside a lot of other people looking for work um, that had far more experience than me. I ended up, I consider myself lucky to have um, gotten a job with one of my professors, uh, Mr. Walter Hood, landscape architecture and um, urban art, art installation artist in Oakland and um, really got kind of the experience of what a small architecture studio, how it runs um, a landscape architecture studio. But, you know, being in the Bay Area kind of got attracted to what was blowing up at the time, which was mobile tech. So I pivoted over to working for a mobile app startup and working for the head of uh, business development and marketing, the head of marketing. And it was there that I really learned all the ins and outs of what it takes to do digital marketing in kind of this new um, emerging media of social media and digital marketing. Um, so got that experience. I uh, ended up started freelancing about eight years ago, working for uh, different social media agencies and social media marketing agencies. And, um, Eventually moved back here to San Diego, where I'm originally from, 
And in going to some networking events, I ran into Denny from, uh, she was working at New School as well at the time, the graphic design program. And she suggested that I teach and teach what I do for a living, which is creative marketing for digital mediums, um, which sounded kind of outlandish at the time. But I know from, you know, being a, a, a continual learner that teaching is the best way to learn and to continue learning. And so the idea of, of teaching really kind of lit me up. Uh, so I started teaching. I met with, um, I met and, and got to experience and visit new school twice before the pandemic happened. <laughs> so I've been teaching since, uh, since the summer and uh, yeah, enjoying it so far, teaching online, um, but looking forward to being back in person one day. So Beth, were you able to teach in person yet? Not yet. Um, this, is my, this is my classroom. Welcome. Okay. School's gonna be a lot more diverse than your than your uh, house, so you can enjoy that. <laughs> that's one of the reasons why I love teaching at these schools because it's so diverse. I got it, I, and Jim said that, and that's that's one of the reasons why I really enjoy our school because you get to learn from so many people from so many different countries and so many parts of the United States. It's fantastic. So our next um, panelist is Christine Wonder, and Christine, what was your path? What brought you to new school? You're muted, Christine. Gotcha. You can hear me now? Perfect. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christine Wonder. And my journey to the new school of architecture and design is probably not as direct as some of the other professors here. Uh, I am not an architect and um, will never be an architect. I am truly a construction manager. So uh, I come from the civil side. Uh, how that journey even began uh, really started with my dad and me as a young little girl. And growing up in New York, he taught me that I could do anything and to never say what if. And he taught me all about tools, and uh, his dream uh, was that one day I own my own home and I be able to take care of it, do all the repairs and, and um, be a proud American homeowner. And uh, being only a third generation American, that was really important to my family. So uh, from there, I uh, at 18 joined the military. I served 21 years in the army. I was what they call a Mustang. It means I was enlisted first. I was an MP, traveled everywhere. Um, then I became a helicopter mechanic, door gunner, crew chief. While I was in the service, I got my two-year degree uh, in industrial tech. I continued with my education while I was in the service. Yes, I went to a lot of colleges and um, got my bachelor's of science in civil engineering construction management, went through OCS, flight school, I flew four different helicopters in the army, 9-11 um, occurred and uh, I was deployed again. Um, I did six tours in combat in Iraq. Um, my last flight, I got wounded very badly and uh, you might not notice, but I'm blind and deaf on my left side and um, hasn't stopped me. I've overcome a tremendous amount of things but that's what drove me into construction management. So I retired from the military at 39 and uh, was pretty young to retire, retire. So I uh, started working with Sunk Construction doing self-performed concrete work. I worked with them for a number of years. From there, I was recruited to Turner Construction. I now have been with Turner Construction for 14 years and uh, we build high-rise commercial construction. That is how I got introduced to the new school through ACE mentoring. So I was an ACE mentor and the new school has been deeply involved in the ACE mentor program. I met this amazing man named George Welsh and he is the one who really introduced teaching as uh, something that I should do. And really share and coach all the knowledge that I have and the experiences I have. So um, hence, I became an adjunct professor in the con construction management aspect and 
specifically in the safety arena. Why safety? I'm the environmental health and safety manager. My goal every day is to build amazing things that you folks design and make sure every single person goes home every day. We build it to plans, to specs, and we go home. So that is how I got into the new school. A quick little side note, I am also alumni. So I also got my master's through the new school of architecture and design. So I am uh, both professor and alumni. That's my journey. Well, thanks. Thanks for your service, Christine. And I'm sure a lot of the, we have quite a few of our students are from the military and I'm sure that they appreciate those stories as well. And I know George has taken a lot of us under his wing. So don't feel special because he <laughs> takes a lot of us under his wing. All right. So, um, but thank you for those stories. So next up is Victor Nassif. Victor, how did you end up in a new school? What was your path? You're, you're on mute, Victor. Thank you. Well, it's pretty simple. Uh, I think all my life I've been a professional dreamer. So to integrate into this school, it's all about dreaming. It's all about looking at the future. And it's actually working with the next generation of professional dreamers. Uh, the young people that will be um, future leaders in uh, industrial design and product design. And uh, the, the way I came about it, it's kind of interesting because when I graduated, I graduated from College for Creative Studies in Detroit. I was very much focused in the automotive industry. And I worked, and I was very fortunate enough to work in multiple countries, mostly in Europe, uh, some in Japan, and some obviously here in the United States. And uh, I, uh, I always enjoyed uh, not only my career, but I enjoyed going to the local schools, the high schools, and then the art schools, and then the uh, design colleges, and meeting with students. Uh, that never escaped me. So uh, upon my retirement from Nissan, this was about five years ago, uh, Penny and I came uh, back to San Diego. Uh, we wanted to uh, kind of set some roots up here and, and uh, help out a little bit uh, with some of the family members. And uh, there was an opportunity for me to teach at New School uh, because I had met Elena. And uh, we chatted about it. Uh, I thought that I might be able to help for like one semester, one quarter, excuse me, or maybe even one year. But uh, four years later, I'm really enjoying it. I love the students. I love them all in terms of uh, the creativity, the passion they have. Uh, this has been a, a bit of a difficult year for all of us, but they're the ones that kind of inspire a lot of positive energy. And, and we're there when, as soon as they come on board, I just kind of focus on them and realize that uh, we're here to all work together to go to the next stage and especially for them to graduate including a promise that I made to them, which is I'm not gonna get my hair cut. You can see my hair is getting pretty long here on the side. I'm not getting a cut until it graduates. So I'll get a cut in June. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. I just, my, I, I'm very lucky. My sister is a hairstylist. So I was just able to get my hair cut for the first time a few days ago. <laughs> I thought this was probably the time I should do it before we do this. So, <laughs> but keep going, Victor. I think, you know, I wish I had a ponytail. <laughs> but so um, next up is Julio. And I'm so sorry, Beth and uh, Victor and Christine. I'm not the greatest moderator. This is my first time. I forgot to read your bios before you started. So I'm going to read Julio's though, because I remembered. So Julio is a licensed architect and associate principal at Silman Wright Architects, San Diego. He has a track record for taking projects from schematic design through uh, project closeout and all phases in between. Julio takes a holistic approach to design, incorporating emerging ideas from tech-driven resources and sustainability. Based on the fundamental principles of livability and sustainability, Julio approaches each project with respect to the unique social, economic, environmental, and geographic conditions integral to each site. So Julio, tell us about your path, buddy. 
Excellent. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, that was great. And um, let me just set my timer here um, so I don't go over because I love to talk and I love to hear myself talk. Um, and before I get started here, Jan, I just want to tell you that Kurt told me the same thing that I was handsome and smart. And that's how he that's how he got me too. darn it. I thought I was the only one. It, I think that's his catchphrase. Right. Um, anyways. So um, first, you know, thanks uh, for having me. This is pretty exciting. This is pretty wild. Um, I appreciate spending the time here with you guys and sharing this conversation. Um, you know, how did I get to New School and, and how did I start teaching? It's a, it's a really interesting story, actually. Um, you know, I'm originally from San Diego um, and I've lived here for the majority of my life. Um, and I actually attended uh, high school right down the street, San Diego High. And um, one of my early memories of New School <clears throat> was, um, you know, walking down the street after school and passing the school and you would see, you know, new school and you can see some of the, uh, the students and, and some of the projects that they were doing. And again, I was, you know, in high school, so I must have been in ninth grade or something. Um, and I always thought to myself, you know, I wonder what they're doing in there. I, I, I kind of had an idea that I like, you know, architecture and, you know, I was always pretty artistic um, and, and, and I also had a knack for like engineering and, and building things and getting stuff done. So I, I wasn't entirely sure where I wanted to go, if I wanted to do sort of the artist route or if I wanted to do the engineering route, you know, and, and I thought, well, darn it, architecture is sort of in the middle of the two. You know, architecture sort of lives in the intersection of engineering and, and, and sort of the artistic realm. So, um, you know, I had, an, I, I had a general idea that I want to do architecture and I was always really curious what was happening, what was happening in, uh, in that building at New School, um, but I never went in. So anyways, you know, we fast forward, I uh, graduated high school, went out of state, um, uh, started uh, to do architecture out of state, architectural school. And, um, you know, life, life happens and, and somehow I ended up back in San Diego and um, I started um, to do a local community college and I did that route for a little bit. And then eventually, um, eventually I applied to New School and I, you know, I got accepted and, and, and I went through the whole process there at New School. Um, and, you know, I, I have to admit, I, I had some really good instructors at New School and, um, and I had some that weren't that good, you know, some that maybe could have done a little better. Um, so I thought to myself, you know, if I ever get the opportunity to teach, I'm going to teach like the instructors that, that really spoke to me and really went out of their way and really, um, you know, paid attention and really wanted to teach the students and give them something. So anyways, um, you know, that, that was that. And I went off and, you know, started, uh, the field and, and, uh, practicing architecture and sort of developing my skills and getting licensed and all that good stuff. And then I, uh, I received a call um, from a good friend, uh, Daniela uh, Deutsch, and uh, she asked if I was interested in teaching. And I thought, you know, I, I always wanted, again, you know, I told myself if I ever teach, I want to be this sort of this type of instructor. Uh, but I just didn't think it was, was going to happen this soon. Um, so I, I told her yes, just because, um, you know, I felt like I had a lot to offer and I can essentially give my studio everything I had, right? And sort of, again, model um, from what I've learned. Um, and that was uh, four years ago. So I've been teaching the fourth year studio for four years now. And I love it. I have such a good time. And, um, you know, my goal is, uh, is essentially to be one of the good ones. That's it. All right. Julio, are you still holding that B plus against me? I'm sorry that was that one of those instructors you're talking about. You didn't do a good job. No, believe it or not. <laughs> so everyone here is a great instructor, and and I, I, I New School is doing such a good job. the The instructors that weren't that good are no longer there. So that oh, just great. goes to show, right? So anyway. and most of the time they get weeded out. Somehow they, they do. Right? They do. Right. Yeah. So and just to let everyone know, I've never had Julio as an, as a student. <laughs> All right. Um, so I got another question for everyone. The second question is, um, if you would be able to share with us one of your human-centered design 
aspects in one of your professional projects that you've done. Um, I think the students would really appreciate the hearing because we're always trying to incorporate this into our um, instruction as well. And so it's good for them to hear how we do this as professionals. So if we can go ahead, we'll start off with uh, Dan again. Okay. Um, is there a screen that's gonna be shared or I'm just gonna start talking and Lucy could figure it out. Um, Human-centered, it's, uh, how, how do you define this? It's, what, it's one of those conversations that um, we have as faculty and it's an ongoing one and, and it changes. Um, architecture is about humans, but which ones? Are we all lumped in as one category of humans? So saying that we're designing for all of them is kind of an impossible thing, an impossible goal. Can't please everyone. I mean, we're not running for president here, but who you choose to design for is, is never wrong. It's, it's a choice. And that defines you as an architect. So are, are you designing a high rise or uh, to maximize office and condo square footage to get the biggest monetary return on investment? So what is your unit value on ROI? I've been involved in marketing a lot here and I like to share a story. This is from Jay Abraham, a guru in marketing. And the story goes back to the 1900s. So kind of bear with me here. Man wants to buy a horse for his daughter. And the first horse trader says, uh, buy this horse. After 30 days, you don't like the horse. I'll take the horse back and give you your money back, right? It's, it's the typical thing that we do in business, okay? The second horse trader says, take the horse. Take my horse. It's a beautiful horse, gentle horse. Don't pay me now. Let your daughter ride the horse. My son will come to your house, feed it hay every day, brush the horse, scoop up the horse shit. And after 30 days, your daughter likes the horse. I will come and collect the payment. So which horse trader should the father buy from? They're both all right. So this is a, really about risk reversal, but I'd like to look at it as more on investment on life. The first trader is clearly about money and the priority about money is his business. The second trader, his priority is in relationships, people. And this project that you see here is on the screen is an example of that. Um, other projects I've worked on, it has been about money awards, but this one is about people. Which ones? Now, which category are we talking about? It wasn't the school district. It wasn't the parents. It was about the students. And we forget about that. Uh, this is a sustainable project. Um, the teachers, the principals, superintendents, they come and go all the time. But that wide-eyed student who wants to learn about sustainability will come to this school. And as you see here on, on the screen here, um, it took a lot of going after this, this project. This is this, the Scripps Sustainable Project in Scripps Ranch. And um, I didn't want to design a building that had teachers teach about sustainability. I wanted the building to teach sustainability. So there's a lot of products on here. Um, uh, we, I wanted, there's a lot more that I wanted to do, but this thing is uh, all about the student learning about sustainability. I'll just give you one example since there's, there's such a ton of things. Um, in this classroom here in the back wall, I have this uh, uh, recycled polygal. And through, the, through that polygal, you could actually see the insulation. And the insulation um, at the time when construction was done, it was uh, recycled jeans for insulation. It probably got you about R11. And the idea was I wanted the students to see this stuff and say, you know what? That's a cool idea, but I think I can do better. So apparently I, had, I talked to the teacher there who was actually an ex-student at new school, said they ripped apart the wall grinded their own tennis shoes and tried to get higher than R11. I think they got to like R13 by asking students at the school to grind down these shoes. And that's great. I would love it 20 years from now that they tear down the school one by one and made the school even better. So in a, in a, in a, in a sense, the building is actually teaching sustainability in itself. So the high rise, that office that I worked on in other cities, it was about the client. It was about the money. That was the priority the first horse trader. But building this school, this was about the students. It was about relationships. So I don't want the students to come through uh, these first four years 
in uh, new school and then show up in fifth year undergraduate thesis with a project that just be proud of. I know they're going to be proud of that. That, that just happens naturally with all the, the great instructors that we have. But I want to share my relationships with these guys. I, I want them to I want to help them get started in their career, have a healthy success in the building industry. But more so, I, I would love to be able to sit down with them 10 years from now, the single malt whiskey, talking about life, music, art, culture, tennis, the Los Angeles Lakers, and how we can help fellow human beings buy a horse for their kids. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dan. It's always hard to uh, follow you, so that's why I'm not following you. That's why I'm gonna ask <laughs> and June to follow you. <laughs> All right. Oh no. <laughs> So, Jim, can you tell us about a project that you had that, in, that um, incorporated yeah. that human-centered design? Yeah, it's not as noble and wonderful as Dan's, but um, this is as close as you get. <laughs> so, um, and one of the things that happened when I went to be interviewed, so this project is the Lafayette Hotel Swim Club and... Um, uh, okay. And as many of you have heard of this or are familiar with this property. It's in the North Park area of San Diego. I got involved with this project about eight years ago. Um, and uh, when I was interviewed by the client, one of the things they said was they were not looking for a designer who had an ego. They wanted somebody very down to earth because this was a very realistic sort of a project. And um, there was very, very stringent budget constraints. Uh, so my clients had purchased this property, which is steeped in Hollywood glamour and history, and it was built in 1946, this building, um, by actually an automobile and um, a, a, somebody who was, was running a car salesmanship in Los Angeles. And this was the place that a lot of the Hollywood stars came uh, to party on their way to Mexico. So there was really no San Diego in those days, 1946. It was going from Los Angeles to Mexico and they would stop by here. Bob Hope is famously known to have stayed in this hotel. So anyway, this was a pretty rundown property when I was, you know, I was hired and they really again had a very stringent budget as I said, they got some help from the city with some help um, from some other sources as well. They had a $6 million renovation but this property is huge. Uh, it's multiple buildings. And a lot of the money was spent really on just trying to fix things that were falling apart. So it wasn't really the interior design budget. Uh, so anyway, we did a lot with what there was, but in this case, as far as human-centered design, what attracted me was that they were trying to create, the, obviously in, this, in a hotel or a hospitality situation, we're trying to find out who the end user is and who we're trying, who's our target market and you know, what exactly, the, who the guest is going to be in this hotel. So the owners, they wanted this to be more of a family friendly hotel. It had larger spaces in all of their rooms. So that was conducive to that. And, um, and it was close, it's not downtown. So it's in a very odd location. It doesn't have the glamor of downtown but it's close enough to where families can come and stay and experience the zoo and other attractions. That was one of, so it needed to be more of an affordable situation. Of course, it's a business. So they needed to make money on it, but at the same time, it needed to be kind of user and, um, and family friendly. The second aspect, the owners really wanted the local community to be involved with this project. So they opened their doors in many ways. There is a large, there's a secret uh, Olympic sized pool in this property. If, any, if you have been there, you would have noticed. So they opened that up to the community during the summers where people would buy bypasses and go and spend time there. And in many other ways, um, like for example, some of the some of the community rooms and meeting rooms were given out to local communities for meetings. Uh, and there was just, they really, really wanted to welcome the neighborhood and the local community into this project. Some of these pictures you see, the first one is of the lobby, which is the only place we spend some money. It almost looks like a movie set of the 1940s. And that's where there was new furniture. The rest of it, a lot of it was very, uh, sustainable where we use source them from local sources they were bought from consignment shops that were refinished reupholstered and this they have these eight bungalows on the property that's what you see in those other three shots underneath and um, so every piece of furniture that I purchased for that but those that project was they came from a source they already existed we didn't buy anything brand new there uh, that was part of that and um, 
uh, well, one interesting fact, which was such a coincidence this morning, I was told the property is in escrow. <laughs> what is the chances of that? So apparently a restaurant, a, a food and beverage company that has its presence in San Diego is now purchasing the Lafayette Hotel. So who knows where it's going to go now? And apparently they're going to remodel it. So of course I won't be part of it, but I'm curious to see what happens next. So the story continues. That's it. Thanks, Anju. And it was great because we had a meeting before this tonight where all the panelists got together and we were talking through things. And it was good to hear that everyone in the panel had stories about the Lafayette Hotel. I know. So that, that was, they, everyone had a great time at the Lafayette Hotel at some point. So that was nice to hear. Yes, um, thank you. So next, we're going to be talking to Beth Aman and uh, Aman. And so I'm going to introduce her bio now because this is a good thing we get to go back through. So now I get to correct my first mistake. So Beth is an architect turned creative marketer. After years of designing for physical spaces, she was lured to the fast paced nature of the tech industry. In 2003, she founded Be This, a design studio specializing in creative content marketing for new media. She now helps brands express themselves and connect with their audiences on the internet through social media creative strategy, marketing campaigns, and content production. Brands she's worked with include the US Forest Service, Smokey the Bear, FEMA, Fitbit, and Crocs. Beth resides in the mountains of San Diego and splits her time between designing for digital worlds, teaching at New School, and developing an ecological preserve. So Beth, can you tell us about your experience with a project that had a human-centered design element. Sure thing, thanks. Um, so the reason why I chose this project is because it really came alive through human action. And so that's kind of the basis of, of why I chose this project in particular. Um, I've worked with the Ad Council for uh, the last four years, working on public service announcement and. Uh, kind of general social good projects. And one of those collaborations was with the United States Forest Service and their campaign uh, Discover the Forest, which encourages eight to 12 year old kids to go out and discover the forest near them. There's a handy little tool online you can put in where you live and find all of the, the open nature spaces uh, near you. So uh, this campaign in particular really started out with trying to put yourself, ourselves in the, in the position of an eight to 12 year old kid experiencing nature for the first time. So um, this photo shoot happened in Oakland. We took kids up to the Redwoods, um, you know, 15 minutes from downtown Oakland and, and really got to capture kind of the, the feelings of discovery and wonder that they experience, um, you know, seeing these places that you know, they've lived 10 minutes away from all their lives and never really got to see. Um, so that's kind of uh, where this idea of telling the story of exploration of nature came from. And so when the uh, Discover the Forest and Ad Council were um, approached by geocaching, we created this uh, kind of little trackable, this little keychain. I designed this keychain for Discover the Forest that, um, would get squirreled away into different geocaches across the United States. Okay, so some context for what geocaching is, is you can get uh, little geolocations and then go out and, and find, you know, find those coordinates and then find little treasures, wherever they might be. They're hidden away all over the, all over the place, all over the world. Um, so I designed these little keychains that you can track um, and the point of the keychains is to take them from cash to cash. And so we created 1500 of these little keychains and, you know, Ad Council and Discover the Forest sent them out to um, people across the United States. And um, from there, they've moved from cash to cash. And, um, you know, kids go out and you can, if you've ever had the experience of finding a geocache, some of you guys have, it is the most thrilling and wonderful experience to finally find geocache and to find a treasure like this Discover the Forest keychain in it. Um, but like I said, the idea of these keychains is to take it from one cache and move it to another cache. And since then, the 1500 keychains have traveled over 5 million miles um, from cache to cache. Uh, across 50 different 
countries in the world. So um, just through, you know, people going out and experiencing nature, this really small design has really come to life and uh, yeah, become gone much farther than I thought that it ever would. Oh, yeah, yep. Yeah. Thanks, Beth. You gave me a great idea for my class. I teach a GIS class during the summer and I think this is something that would be a fun activity for them. And I think it could be something fun that we could do maybe through um, student, through the student activities maybe with Ashley. Maybe we could organize something where we could have a big scavenger hunt with geocaching. That, that could be fun since we can probably do it with our phones, correct? Yep, yep. Uh... Yep, you just get the coordinates on your phone and you can find them. I think there's like two or three of these keychains in San Diego, the Discover the Forest ones. There's also one that I made for Smokey Bear. Um, I think there's a couple of them around San Diego as well. So you can go out and find one for yourself. All right. Thanks, Beth. So next, uh, we're going to ask Christine the same thing, except I want to introduce her. I want to give her bio real quick. She served in 21 years in the Army, was accepted in the Officer Candidate School Program and graduated top in her OCS class. In 2003, Christine was deployed to Iraq to support Operation uh, Iraq, Iraqi Freedom and served four tours as a pilot and was awarded a Bronze Star, Purple Heart, and Air Medal. She currently is the Environmental Health and Safety Director for Turner Construction and recently completed the Ballpark Village the San Diego New Central Library Project, and many more. So, Christine, with that, what's a project you'd like to tell us about concerning human-centered design? I can think of no greater project than a project that I've actually done a number of times. And by that, I mean, I am now on my fourth project at our beautiful San Diego International Airport. What other than an airport has so much human-centered design in it. I challenge you the next time that you're there, whether you're dropping someone off or whether you're actually a traveler going from one location to another to actually look at it differently. Just take a moment and look at parking. Look at how the drop-off works. Look at how it's easily navigated. Wayfair, Wayfair signing. Uh, signage from ADA compliance to just traveler ease. You know, when you have families with children in tow and bags and service animals and all kinds of chaos and they're frantically trying to find their gates, they can self find their gates. Um, that is human centered design. Every single one of these projects that I've been on on the San Diego airport have been designed build. So even though I'm not an architect and not a designer myself, I am a part of a fully integrated team that works collectively together to actually build these structures collectively as the design is being done at the same time. So we have to act collectively together as a team. Some of the things that we have to pay attention to with an airport is anxious travelers and what colors should things be to bring down that anxious level? What is the design? Is there art? Is there things for people to look at? How is the logistics being handled? Do you see all the bags moving around? Do you see all of the aircraft maintenance and, and maintenance of the um, airport itself? No, you don't. That's with intention. It is absolutely through the design. Think of security, customs, TSA, and now how we have to keep everyone safe. If you didn't feel safe in an airport, your anxiety would go much higher. So we have to really look at all of those different aspects. And now the newest one is technology. With everyone being so wired, we've had to change how the areas of the terminals are. Everyone needs to be plugged in. Do you remember the day when you used to have to crawl under the seats and try and find an outlet and plug in? Well, now we actually have charging stations and everything is COVID friendly. So this is all part of that human-centered design. 
two of the things that I want to bring up specifically on the FIS, which is the new um, federal international arrival area of Terminal 2, is some of the art. I, I think people don't really think of an airport as having quality art and why it's there. And yet there's two very specific art features in this new area. One you can see in the photo that you, it has the white background and it has pictures. Um, it has 52 different glass panels. It's actually called Carry On. It's 225 feet long. It has 624 actual photos of unique different items. And those items are to symbolize community, family, and culture. What, who would have thought that in an airport that we're trying to symbolize community, family, and culture? And then in the other building, and you've probably seen it if you've driven by the international arrival area of, of Terminal 2, is a piece of art called Paths Woven. This is a series of wood ladders. There's actually 24 maple ladders and one very special, very different California walnut ladder. It has 72 gallons of glue and over 500 clamps that hold this structure together. And when you look up and you see this piece of art made of all these ladders and you, you can't help but wonder, what were they thinking? Right? What was that, that aspect? And when I tell you, you're going to go, I get it. The artists were symbolizing the many different journeys that converge at airports and how all these ladders intertwine and twist together. And that's how people travel through airports. They have this journey and it brings people and different things together. So um, I love the fact that this is a design build, that I'm a part of that design from making it appealing from the entryway to ensuring that the flooring that we put down is terrazzo flooring. Why terrazzo flooring? Well, have you ever been in an airport that has carpet and how hard is it to pull your wheels on your bags on that carpet? It's exhausting. Or tile. And you hear that ba bump ba bump ba bump ba bump ba bump ba bump ba and you hear it 500 times, and it's actually extremely loud. So when designers use terrazzo, it silences that. It makes it so that there's no drag, and you don't hear it. So part of these design features are human centered, and you you don't tend to think of an airport that way, but it is. The other thing that I'm really, really proud of is we were able to do all these projects while the airport was active. We never shut down any flights or interfered with travel. Um, we were pretty, I'll call it blind to the passengers. Um, so even our construction walls were what we call McCain walls and they had art on it and Wayfair signings and all kinds of things to distract the passengers from understanding that those temporary walls were hiding construction behind it. So all of this is part of that human centered design and making sure that when people come to the San Diego International Airport, they have an amazing experience. One of the things that's attached are some fun facts. Knowing that I'm that construction management side, I would be wrong if I didn't identify some of this cool, unique stuff. 200,000 pounds of sheet metal went into just the FIS project, which is the modification of Terminal 2 to become an international arrival gate. 81 piles of concrete that were um, driven or, or piled down 55 feet down into the ground. We added four escalators, three elevators. We obtained lead silver and had over 500,000 man hours. That's a half a million hours that people worked without people noticing us. Um, lastly, we finished it exactly in a year. 
365 days from groundbreaking to ribbon cutting and certificate of occupancy. That's a huge milestone and a huge win. Design build works. Mm -hmm. But it really Thank you, Christine. is a good system. So make sure all of you uh, interior designers don't paint your airports red. Okay. Don't well, paint them red. Any uh, crazy, we can't handle more craziness in our airport. So, Victor, we'd like to hear from you. What, tell us about one of your human centered design projects. Well, uh, Trevor, are you going to uh, say a little bit about my bio or, or should I just start it? Thank you. I, I, I thought you were going to make let me uh, make my third mistake. So, let, let me introduce uh, Victor. So, Victor is Artistic abilities and passion for cars led him to a 38 year career in the automotive industry with Ford, Peugeot, and Nissan. During his career, he's lived and worked in the USA, England, Germany, Italy, Japan, Spain, and France. He now works on a variety of projects that entail interior design, project design, and human centric design for the office space. He is chief creative officer at, at brochure.com a visually stunning software for the travel industry. All right, Victor. Okay, thank you, Trevor. Um, so human-centered design from a product standpoint, we've been working on this for many, many years. Uh, it, it really comes down to four major factors. I know there's other factors and there's other layers that we can talk about when it comes to human-centered design, but the four factors that I'm going to talk about today is really number one, which is an understanding of the human factors and good design ergonomics. This is something that has been studied only very, very recently. And by that, I mean, is really from the 1950s onward that human factors really started to get studied. And there's a fantastic book actually that the library has, which is called The Measure of Man, which became kind of the Bible of human factors. Uh, the second element, and I'll, I'll go into greater detail for each one. I'll tell a little story of each one when I get to the end. So the second factor is really our senses. We always have to keep that in mind, is that our senses, uh, the smell, taste, touch, hear, and hearing, and seeing, tell us a lot. They either make us feel uncomfortable or they make us feel very comfortable. They're, re they're reassuring and trustworthy, or it's not. Our senses never lie to us, and they're very, very finely tuned. The third one is our intuition. And the intuition comes from, for example, this product, which is a sport utility vehicle. It started really in the mid 80s. This is probably the best example, which is the Lexus. And the reason it's the best example is because it incorporated uh, a lot of what was best in regular vehicles of the time. One, which was it had a sport utility feature. Secondly, it had the, the, the comfort of a sedan, a four-door sedan. So it was easy to get in and out of. And third, it, it, uh, it merged the polyvalence of, of a wagon. So those were the three elements of our intuition, the intuition of doing the right product at the right time. And then the fourth one was really an understanding of the journey. Uh, this, this is, again, another concept that's come fairly recently. Uh, up until not too long ago, people would just go in and purchase a product. And we never knew what made them purchase that product, what led them to the decision to purchase the product. And also, when you purchase a product, there's also the aftermarket. In other words, the, the care that goes into usage, the understanding that if there's a problem, who can help you with it? that whole customer journey has become really, really important. So we're trying to encompass everything. So going back to the, the four points, I'm going to give you one example of each. So the understanding of human factors and good design has a story behind uh, the ergonomics of this vehicle. The Japanese male is very similar to the American female in stature. And what became interesting is whenever women would go and sit in multiple cars, they would always come back to this type of vehicle. They felt comfortable. Why? Because the Japanese male engineered, engineer had designed it and engineered it for themselves, which happened to fit a female customer here in the United States. 
uh, up until then in the United States, a lot of our engineers, obviously being male, were doing it for the male customer, not the female customer. Basically, 50% of our customers were being ignored. And these are the first line of products that were actually taking women and what women, uh, how they drove, uh, how they used it, how comfortable they felt in it. That's how they started using it as a priority. For our senses, for example, those were the first types of products that took into account um, how the doors opened, how they felt. Was it easy to open up the door? Were the handles easy to access? Uh, if you look at the handles on, on, the, on the doors, it made it simple for somebody with long nails, for example, to get their hand in and open up the door without breaking their nails. Before then, it used to be these paddles that you used to have to put your hand underneath and pull it out. Well, for guys, it was never really a problem. But for women, it became a problem because it would break their nails. So these were the first types of doors that actually started taking into account, again, the female user. Another thing were the buttons and switches and knobs. All of those have a very, very good tactile sense, an auditory sense. They were based on Sony sound systems, Bang & Olufsen sound systems. And again, previous to that, those buttons did not have the same sense of quality. And then on the third one, which is our intuition, notice the low liftover of the back of the, the, the hatchback. It wasn't so high that it would be difficult for somebody to carry a package and put it in. Uh, the, the great visibility all, overall, all around. The light colored interiors. Interiors were normally black uh, during the 70s and 80s. They didn't have a variety of colors. In the 50s, yes, they had a lot of different colors. But in the 70s and 80s, most of the interiors were black. And then comfortable and not intimidating in everything that it was done. Everything was very tone on tone very elegant, light carpets, et cetera. And then the fourth one, which is really understanding the journey, talks about that low stress of the purchase. There wasn't this element of coming into a dealership and being stressed out because, uh, for example, some of, the, some of the dealers were actually looking at the male instead of the female customer. And they were ignoring the, the, the questions that were being asked by the female customer. All that has completely changed, obviously. There was also a waiting area that was created in the dealerships because up until then, you just hung around the garage area while they were fixing your car or you went out for a cup of coffee across the street. Now they start creating these beautiful lounges that actually people can go sit down, conduct their businesses while they're still waiting for their vehicles. So those are the four issues. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. And I want to congratulate everyone who's attending right now. If you look in your email box, you'll see a special certificate from Victor. Everyone gets a free Lexus tonight. So congratulations to everyone. That's courtesy of Victor. Don't forget to give him my phone number. That's right. <laughs> Just contact Victor if that email doesn't come to you. So make sure you get in touch with him right away. All right. So moving on, let's go to, let's go to Julio. Man, I cracked myself up. Let's go to Julio. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Trevor. Do you want to read my bio again? No. Do you no, like it good. for the second time? I can read it for the second time. <laughs> no, thanks, Trevor. You're doing an excellent job, by the way. So thanks. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's review this uh, this project here. I selected um, before we dive uh, too much into it. I kind of want to give you a little background, a little story on uh, on why I selected this project. Not only is it human-centered um, or human-centered design, and I'll get into some of the specifics, but um, this is the Santa Isabel Nature Center, which is located here in the San Diego um, East County, and it actually just opened uh, 2019. So um, not too long ago, it was, it was completed. Um, but, but again, before I go into too much detail, um, you know, I actually had the opportunity to designed this project as a student when I was in a local community college um, and um, I don't know, 12 years ago or whatever. And, um, and, and then, you know, chances, chances are, or, or, or you know, just the, the way things happen, um, I, I, I received the opportunity to design it as a, as a professional as well. 
um, which is really cool. And I just wanted to share that with you guys that, um, you know, as students, a lot of times you're sort of designing these, you know, makeshift projects, but you just never know. You never know. You may have the opportunity to design, design it in real life or, or for, for your project to come to fruition. Um, and then there's actually some similarities of the initial design of, you know, when I designed it as a student and then what you see now here, um, which is, which is uh, a lot of fun, but anyways, let's, let's dive into the project a little bit. So, um, human centered, um, you know, first and foremost, um, the project is a, um, uh, in, in intertwine there. Um, again, in the East County, in the open fields, uh, you can sort of see there in the bottom of the picture, it's it's snuggled um, against the hillside um, and surrounded by the um, oak trees. And, um, you know, this this uh, facility uh, belongs to the uh, County of San Diego Parks and Recs. And uh, we spent a lot of time making sure that the building was situated properly on the site. And um, the form it has or its location has to do with the Engelman Oaks and the setbacks. So we wanted to make sure that um, as the project um, was coming to fruition and was being constructed, that none of the Engelman Oaks uh, would be harmed um, or, or de therefore die. Um, so we actually established a 50 foot setback from the drip line. Um, so it's it's sort of nestled and, and laid out the way it is to accommodate that that setback from those trees. Um, and as you're driving down the road, this is right before you get up to Julian. Um, the building, you don't you actually don't see the building from the from the road from the main highway. Um, you just see the, the 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 main entry, and you sort of make your way up uh, a meandering path, um, and then sort of the building kind of opens up um, to you. Um, so that was that was a that was a huge focus as as we were developing the design. The other focus was to make sure that the building would fit within the local community um, and the local architecture and sort of the historic nature of the site. So when we were designing the form and the shapes, you know, we picked some of the the gable roofs um, and some of the the, the wood siding there and um, some of the stone to reflect the Santa Isabel um, history and also the Julian sort of historic architecture um, so that it fits with, within the landscape, it fits within the community. Um, but overall, again, it's a, it's a nature center um, and the emphasis is to um, provide the, the public um, with a space um, where sustainability is um, it's highly thought of um, it, where uh, kids and, and students can go in and, and learn, um, you know, the environmental sensibility of the site and then also the historic celebration. So you can see um, part of the exhibit there on the right hand side with the big tree and the big trees, is, you know, it's animated and you can go in and sort of experience the, the flora and fauna that you would find on site. Um, so you learn about what you would find on site sort of in the exhibit. And then you go off and, uh, and you identify uh, what you just saw out in nature. So it's essentially bringing the user one with nature and um, the, the site is situated uh, next to a trail or multiple trails. I think it's over 20 miles of trails that you can go off hiking. And before you go off, you would pass um, sort of the gateway there um, that you see there on the left-hand side, which is the, the bells. Um, and the bells are real bells and you can ring the clapper and sort of, um, you know, announce that you're going off on your departure. And it's an interesting story on the bells as well. Um, it, again, it's just a, um, a tribute to the local Santa Isabel mission that is right up the road there about a mile north. And um, the story has it that the bells in the early um, 1900s, 1926 or so, um, the bells were stolen. And, uh, and they were never seen again. So then this is an idea of bringing, the, bringing that history, bringing that celebration back to the site. Um, so, the, so the bells are there and uh, the bells are under heavy security. So don't think about any, you know, don't think about taking them. There's, there's heavy security around it at all times. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is the picture there on the top left is the nature-based play area. And um, the, the space there was designated um, with nature in mind. 
so that the children and, and the users who are going to play and experience that space um, aren't necessarily play, playing with prefab elements, but rather with elements that are brought from the site or, or, or other county sites. Um, so you can see sort of the, the eucalyptus uh, tree stumps um, and the majority, except for the slide, which was prefab, um, but the majority of the site there, um, uh, it, it's all nature inspired elements, um, which again, it goes back to the human center design. Thanks, Trevor. All right, Julia. I think uh, Ashley's ears are probably burning. I, I'm sure she's probably lining up a, another student activity as we speak. I can see us all going up to Julian, having some pie, and then ringing that bell and hiking it off. So I think that'd be fun. I think we could have a good time doing that. So at this point, um, I was going to talk about myself, but I, we don't have enough time. We want to go into Q&A, but if you want to hear about me, just sign up for my class and I'll talk about myself every day. So you can you can do that if, you, if you'd like to. So um, we, we have some questions that we've gotten from the audience. Um, let's see. One of the questions is, um, I have, so this is from Daniel Hardin. I have restoration construction project management experience with an unrelated bachelor's degree. I'm currently in school full-time for architecture as East Los Angeles College, at East Los Angeles College, and I'm kind of wondering what direction I should go in now. I didn't realize how many avenues, directions I could go with a master's in architecture. What's your advice on how to narrow down or find a more specified path I may like or enjoy? Anyone have any advice? So I think I think we're all just kind of rereading it. Um, uh, it. You know, my my initial thought would be, you know, I think it's important to identify sort of the niche or or you know what really drives you, um, especially with a, a background in design. Um, like you mentioned, the the opportunities are endless. But once you find that uh, that niche or, or whatever is really driving you. Um, uh, you would essentially, if you've heard it before, you, you would never work a day in your life because essentially you're doing what you love. And a lot, I think a lot of the, the panelists you have here, and I think um, Christine could, can, can add to it, you know, we're passionate about it. We, we love it. We, we wake up, we want to go to work. We want to continue doing what we're doing, whether it's teaching or, or whether it's, you know, our professional um, work. Um, so, so it's, it's a little bit of a cop-out answer, but if you, if you can find what really drives you, um, I think, yeah, I think you should definitely go, go with that. Any other advice? Yeah. Can, can I just add just one thing, just real quick thing. And, and what Julio said is right. Make it and quick, what, whatever doors you, you see, um, uh, take a step through there and, and and add to it it's it's life is really 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 short here and in in the business of architecture is even shorter so um uh, you may think that what you do now is what you want to do but i'm telling you 70 years later you have compounded all your experience to find out so many other things i mean look at the panelists here and what direction they went to they started an architecture school and now they're doing what they want to do so my my words to you, Danielle, is, is whatever avenue you do take, make sure it's the one that opens the most doors for you. That's, that, that would be my suggestion. All right, great advice, Dan. Um, there's, we have another question. It says, um, how are practitioners like yourselves best suited to prepare students for the professional world? Beth, what do you think about that? Or Anju, Victor? Yeah, so, um... I, I um, in every class I teach, be it studio or lecture, I always bring in what I do each day. Like I talk about it, this experience that I share. Like sometimes it's totally related to the class. Sometimes it's a little uh, not quite completely related. And almost in every class I've invited, uh, it's great to have 
access to industry professionals that I work with. So even in today, I had somebody come in from the fabric industry. These are real people that I work with every day that I have worked with. These are relationships and they kind of see uh, students get exposed to that. Obviously you can't expose them to everything, but whatever. So I feel there's a great deal of value because I feel um, I have access to these kinds of individuals. And of course my own professional practice and experiences from that both good and bad, I'm always sharing that. So hoping that it gives them a realistic point of view and interior design is not just a glamorous profession, so. <laughs> yeah, and to add on that, uh, just understanding the value that design brings to businesses. I teach marketing and business. Um, it, you know, just being able to say, you know, designing something so simple can bring money to a company. And so therefore uh, you should value it in yourself. That's kind of the experience that I bring into my class, always trying to stress the value, the, the monetary value that design can have on any industry. And from a product design standpoint, if I can add here, um, it, it's, it's very simple. I run the class, uh, especially because they're seniors, like a regular studio. So I'm actually preparing them for when they go out into a studio situation. Uh, that's how you do it. You just basically prepare them for the pros. All right, and let me ask, there's one more question. This is from Elena. Do you think that the interaction among the different disciplines of useful contributes to the idea of human-centered design? And how could we collaborate even more? Christine, what do you think? You're shaking your head. <laughs> I absolutely think that being together, the builders, the designers, all the different types of designers. I mean, it doesn't just take one architect. You have a civil, you have, there's many different um, avenues that have to come together. And just by doing that, we deal with our own issues and human-centered issues as we go through all of this. And it's amazing how it will stir your creativity to look at things differently. You know, it, sometimes the quietest person in the room will all of a sudden just raise their hand and be like, ah, you know what? Wouldn't it be better if we maybe tried this? And all of a sudden everyone's like, you're absolutely right. And, and that will stem a whole nother avenue and idea. So what you have to do is get to a point where you actually trust each other. When you get there and you're not afraid to hurt someone's feelings and, and you just know that it's for the better of the program, the project, whatever it is that you're working on, you'd be amazed what you can actually build and come up with. Great advice. And last, last thing, because we have only uh, about eight minutes left. So um, if each of you can offer advice to our students and and our guests here on this Zoom call, what would you, what would be your piece of advice that you'd give them to chart their own path? And Jim, what would you, and Jim, okay. what would you say? Yeah, so for me, very, it means uh, what I would like to tell the students is to go out and experience actual spaces and go and actually look at products in real life. I know these days with the pandemic, we're unable to, but it's nothing like, like when you see a light fixture light up in person, it's completely different than when you look at it on a computer. So the virtual world is wonderful and we've been able to survive because of it. But absolutely, when you're able to, you have to see and touch the real things like fabrics and anything that I work with. There's no nothing to replace that. So and you get such a different sense of scale and design and you really understand things better in person. And uh, Beth, what would, you, what would be your advice? Uh, my advice would be to stay curious because, you know, if someone told me when I went into college that I'd be working in social media, like that didn't exist <laughs> when I started architecture school and it didn't seem like a path forward. But because of staying curious and using every opportunity to learn, um, you know, on the job sometimes, you know, led me to where I am today. And, you know, I love what I do. And I think it's because I've, you know, stay curious and really kind of follow my passion. So that's, that's what I would suggest. Stay curious. And Victor? 
Uh, for me, it's very simple. Uh, Human-centered design is not a one-hour class. It's a class that deals with a lifetime. It is uh, a world of experience. It's uh, using all your senses and using uh, a, a lifetime of experience to really understand the real problem. Uh, sometimes, especially when we become extremely well-educated, uh, people feel that they can give an answer within 30 seconds, but it, we don't need to. What we need to do is look at the real problem and come up with real solutions and really address the, the right thing, what's needed. That's it. Julio? Sure, thanks Trevor. Um, I'll keep mine pretty brief. You know, my, my biggest advice to students is um, to just essentially bring your best, you know, put your best uh, foot forward. Um, and, and what I mean by that is all of us here as instructors, professors, we are a direct reflection of you. So if you bring your high energy excitement, um, uh, you know, a hard work ethic, we feed off of that, believe me. And we give you that right back. So if you want to make the most out of your education, you know, bring everything you got to the table so that we can reflect that. And then, and then we can give you everything we have. That's it. And Jim. Um, tonight, you, you've heard a lot of different paths here. And what you should get out of it is that not one path is better than the other. Rather, there are different paths to take. Experience as many as you can. I stated earlier that uh, life changes, culture, people. That's why we are new school. Be a part of that change. So what's your mark? If a thousand years were to pass in an instant, what would be your remembrance? And I think it's going to be your process, the process that you share. So create your own process of getting to those paths. Share your story with others to inspire them in their path to business later on. And remember this about success, you guys. It's not what I say. It's not what they say. It's what you say. So here at New School, any architecture school, college, or whatever university you're attending right now, as your teachers, your instructors, we're, we're really here to help you fill your toolbox. We're, gonna, we're trying to help you build this process for a very productive life. And, and of course, to remind you of your passion for design. And if I could end with this, it's a quote from Dickie Fox in the movie, Jerry Maguire. If this is empty, this doesn't matter. Thank you, and, and good luck to you all. All right, Dan. And now you forced me to follow you, because I shouldn't have called on you last. So, now, so I would give two pieces of advice. My first one would be to always look around and imagine how things could be and not how they are. It's, it's fun. It can be a game. It, it becomes fun, and, and if you make it a daily practice, it becomes automatic. And uh, that will help you get through a lot of your... Um, blocks as a professional, your mental blocks. Always imagine how things could be and not how they are. And I would also tell you that one, one thing that was told to me when I was very young in my late teens or early 20s, it really stuck with me. And it actually comes to this human-centered design concept is um, people don't care about what you know. They only want to know that you care. And it's at that point they care about what you know. So um, I, I'm, I'm grateful that everyone showed up tonight. I'm grateful that we had really good panelists who you can take a lot from. I hope that, uh, as you see, we have amazing faculty here who have dedicated their lives and are very passionate about teaching you and have a very valuable, a ton of skill sets that they're bringing to their classrooms and they're sharing with you all the practical things that you might come into contact with as a professional, rather than going to a traditional university where you're gonna hear a lot of theories, we are gonna be telling you what it's actually like at the job site, what it's like in the office, all the things that may confront you as a professional. And um, this is why I was very happy and I'm proud to, uh, be the moderator for tonight in this particular subject. So thank you everyone for showing up. Thank you everyone for coming. And remember to look in your email box for that free Lexus. <laughs> <laughs> remember, 
contact Victor. If you don't get it, if you don't get it, contact Victor. I'm in trouble now. I'm in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. And thank you, Lucy and Ashley. For the they're the organizers of this event tonight. So thank you, Lucy and Ashley. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. All right. Have thank a great night, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Good night. Bye. Bye.